I saw this movie at Sundance. That's a long time ago. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's been, when did you first, you had this sort of weird virtual premiere. When did you first get to see it with an audience? Uh, in my living room. Um, let's see, what do I remember about that morning? One, uh, I was tricked into being a cat dad. My girlfriend was sort of like, surprise, we got two kittens. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I was dealing with the uh, you know, crying the first week born. Um, yeah, I got to see it in my living room. I'd, I'd sort of, with the exception of um, our final sound mix, I was really very, I, I was aware to not overdo it in, in watching it because I didn't want to be numb to it to the point where when this part of the process starts that I, okay, I must go outside and get on my phone or whatever. I still wanted to have, I think I have about 50 viewings of it before I'll not get goosebumps. And that's the whole thing. Like I still get excited when I see it. Yeah. So I understand that the producers pitched this to you at the Tonight Show in in the kitty green room. Yeah, I joke. I, I know Robert and David hate when I say this, but <laughs> because we were like red hot at the time, I was like, man, people say anything to get into the Tonight Show, man. This thing never existed. <laughs> no, I, I was joking that, uh, you know, in my mind, I just thought that I knew everything that was important about music and music happenings. So how are you going to tell me that somewhere in time, Stevie Wonder and Staple Singers and Sly and the Family Stone and David Ruffin and B.B. King and the Chambers Brothers, like all these acts were in, in the, 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 the section of Harlem in Manhattan. And you're telling me that over, you know, uh, 200,000 people seen this and there's not one document of it and even on the side I was calling like people I knew like Nelson George whatever like yo man you know about that? no I never heard of this thing in it and so I just I I didn't believe it and then I put two and two together once they finally brought me the evidence in like a, a really uh overwhelming way like 40 hours of <laughs> here's your evidence um and when i saw the backdrop of the stage i realized oh man the first time i went to japan um my translator well she looked at my afro and was like i think you're a fan of don cornelius of soul train aren't you and i was like yeah <laughs> and uh she's like great i'm gonna take you to the soul train cafe and I was like, what's that? And basically, it's, it's, it's like a Chili's or a Friday's, but just with a bunch of monitors in it with, with soul clips. And uh, I, I remember seeing on the monitor screen maybe seven or eight minutes of uh, Sly and the Family Stone. And uh, at the time, I just thought it was, it was an outdoor European festival. I thought it was like the Nice Jazz Festival. I was trying to figure out, like, okay, I know Nice is outdoors. I know that some parts of Montro is outdoors. So I just said, you know, European festival, because I didn't see the audience at all. They just had like one camera, maybe camera two and camera three, strictly on stage, and I couldn't see the faces. So, you know, that was 1997. So then cut to 20 years later, uh, getting pitched to do this. And, um, you know, it, like with everything in my life, be it teaching, NYU or, or writing books or entering the food world or even the Tonight Show, like anything that's out of my comfort. I'm, I'm the one that's always thrown in the comfort zone. Like, go to Mirrors, swim. And they, you know, many a bungee jumping cord. And I just, I had to find it within me to r rise to the occasion. They knew I had, they knew I had it in me to do it and I didn't know it. So... What do you think was the reason that pushed you into the yes column? What, what really motivated you the, to feel compelled to take this on? It's weird, like, between, between David and Robert, like, you know, because again, I was in Matrix bullet dodging responsibility. I was just like, you know, <laughs> I don't want to do this. And, you know, at the time, 
Um, you know, Hamilton was like red hot, and I was just telling them, like, let me just be like executive producer, and I'll still be your talking head, you know? I said, I'll be Ronald McDonald, and you find me some Ray Kroc people to, you know, to put this thing together, and I'll still be, you know, it could still work for you. And they were like, no, like, you're a storyteller, and you see music and, and a different filter than the average documentary person would see it. Like, we know that you, the way that you see music, and I thought about it, and I guess I didn't want to be the person. I'm the person in the audience that will, you know, I'll be the one telling my date, like, oh, man, no, that was Phil Spector. They got that one wrong. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm a walking uh, pop-up video <laughs> commentary person. So I didn't want to, and it just irks me. I'm, I'm literally the person, like, even, like, when I'm friends with these people, I hate correcting them on like, ah, that was the wrong year, man. Walk This Way came out in 86. And, <laughs> and I just wanted to make sure I had an enjoyable time in a theater watching a factual music documentary. So then I was just like, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it, you know. So I did it. So <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So being, being a first-time filmmaker can be an asset, in a way, because you were bringing a different skill set to it. And, you, and I felt like this was a different rhythm, different cadence, uh, not, not your straight on. You know what's weird? Okay, so um, I was 17 years old when I, I feel like every creative has, um, has that moment in their life where there's the that, that come to Jesus moment with something that happens creatively that absolutely cracks your skull open to the possibilities and the beauty of what life could be. And when I was 17, um, it, people that know my story know that I, I drummed with my fathers like since I was a kid. My dad was like an oldies doo-wop singer back in the 50s. So by the time I was born, um, I was part of the, the nostalgia part of it. Like Dick Clark would put these shows together and that sort of thing. And so Philadelphia. And Philly, yeah. Um, and so uh, when I graduated high school, um, uh, on my well, I was applying for either Juilliard or um, the new school. And so I got a job at a, as a short order cook uh, working at Big, Big Al's restaurant. Big Al was the character from Happy Days that or if you guys remember the Buddy Holly video with Weezer, like the guy that owned, well, you guys know Big I'm not the only person of my age here. Um, so the morning I started, um, Public Enemy had released their second album. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. And there's always that soundtrack for a teenager that changes people's lives, be it, never mind the Bullocks, here comes the Sex Pistols or the first Bad Brains records, like that that one rebellious uh, entity. It could be Nirvana's uh, Nevermind. Um, but for me, as a 17-year-old, um, what made that Public Enemy album so compelling was the fact that um, it made my dad's 3,000-plus record collection seem cool. Like, I always saw his records as like, yeah. Marvin Gaye, whatever, like adult, adult music, even, and that's the thing, I, I, I don't want to lead, I don't want to ever uh, lead people with the, this idea that I just came out the womb, this like all-knowing sage of music. One of the most important elements of my life was that I lived in a don't touch my stereo household. <laughs> so in some ways, like I was, I, I won't say like Stockholm Syndrome, but like I was forced to listen to like all that music, I didn't want to listen to Mathis or Streisand or Pet Sounds or any of those records that my dad and my mom, like they have really weird taste for, you know, black parents in the inner city. Like, <laughs> I don't know if I should have known what Pet Sounds was at the age of four, but I did. So, um, yeah, and I, I would have preferred to put on the Jackson 5, but I, I wasn't allowed to touch the stereo. Um, so that said, to hear the way that Public Enemy produced music, they just, they were Jackson Pollock. They just had 25 samples in there. And suddenly, like, whoa, that's my sister's David Bowie sample. 
that's George Clinton, that's Glass Night in the Pips, that's The Temptations Live, that's, you know, became like, name that tune. And with this film, like, they totally rewrote what music could be. Like, and music experts, of course, like my dad was like, ah, that's garbage, then. You know, he, he couldn't see the beauty that I saw in it. And I just felt like maybe that's the approach that we, we take with this film. And, you know, my, uh, my producing partner, Joseph Patel, said, well, you know, congratulations. Joseph, uh, my producing partner, he wrote, like, our first cover story like 25 years ago. So he and I sort of grew up in music together. And now we're like taking this journey with, with, with film. And he was like, congratulations. Like you always wanted to be a member of the Bomb Squad production unit for Public Enemies albums. And this is, this is it, so. So did uh, you lean into drumming just a little? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I wanted, there's definitely a, a rhythm to it. Um, when I was struggling to figure out like what is my voice, what is my like what is it? Because even at the time when we were editing, and we were editing during the quarantine, and I happened to be quarantining uh, with some friends of mine in upstate New York on their farm, because you know t to quarantine in small New York apartment quarters means like disaster for your relationship. So I needed we needed land to not feel like, you know, TMI. Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and having, and having uh, space and whatnot, um, the family that we were quarantining with, um, the father of the family was like, this is great, but like, where are you in this? And I guess he was referring to the fact that Prior to this, if it was a music documentary, you you know, nine times out of nine, you would see me in there offering my take on whatever said documentary was about. And I, I was hyper aware to not insert myself. I didn't want this to be like the Quest Love, Summer of Soul, like that sort of thing. I didn't want to brand myself in it. And so I was just trying to figure out ways, like what is my voice in this thing? And... Uh, Joseph suggested to me, like, well, I know the process that you do for DJ gigs, and I have a very specific formula for how I do DJ gigs. Like, I work backwards. I always start with, what do I want to leave the people with? And this is the same thing. What's my ending? And I wanted to figure out what's my last 10 minutes, and what do I want people to feel when they watch this? And then it was just a matter of spending that five months. I have five months to just sit and marinate with all this uh, material because it took five months to, for us to process um, those two inch reels. Two inch video. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's good. It's flawless. It's it was beautiful. absolutely, even the sound that you heard was pretty much the, the rough mix, like straight from their boards. Wow. And that's one of the wow. biggest, that to me is one of the like I called all my engineers, all my sound guys, like, wait a minute, how is it this pristine with just 15 microphones? And yet, I asked my, like, uh, my main sound guy a month after the movie came out. I was like, how many inputs do we use? He's like, just for the roots alone? I was like, yeah. He's like, uh, uh, I brought it down to about 94. I was like, 94 inputs? He's like, yeah, man, you got two snare drums and da 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 and one top tom, one bottom tom, and... I was just, I felt ashamed. I'm like, how did this sound so powerful and so crisp and pristine with with just so clear and only with 15 microphones? And it was sitting in a basement for 40 years. It sat in the basement for the 50 longest. 50 years. Yeah, it sat in the basement for the longest. So when we took it out, uh, as far as I know, there was only seven people uh, that even had operational machines that could even play it back. Um, and five of those people knew exactly how to treat it as far as like baking it and, and going through a fine tooth comb and brushing off the film perfectly. And it came back to us without spot nor wrinkle. Like, Excellent. yeah. Excellent. So why was this in a basement for 50, 50 years? Well, Harris Tulchin shot it. It was great. Um, 
I drove by Woodstock when I was uh, really young mm -hmm. <laughs> and couldn't go. Did you go? Okay. okay. <laughs> I, I lived on 110th Street in Columbus. This was blocks away from my house. I had no idea. you didn't know about idea. this? Right. None. Okay. That Nobody makes two of heard us. of it. And Nobody we're Thompsons. Did. So... <laughs> Yeah, I was like, Mom, why didn't you? anyone know about this, and why was it hidden, and why wasn't anyone interested in it? Um, you know, of course, we explore and and speculate on why this came out the way it did. This whole entire situation, um, and I was trying to think, like, okay. What was the pitch? Because even in Hal Tolchin's uh, notes, what he left us behind, that told a lot of the story, at least in, he left behind like notes of uh, planning, uh, letters written to whatever uh, companies coming to shoot it and whatnot. Even I believe like some uh, rejection letters or that sort of thing. Um, I was just trying to put two two together like, well, okay, 69, I feel like most of, the, most of these artists were kind of on the diving board, one diving board jump away from uh, their legendary level. So, so little Stevie Wonder was still little. Well, I mean, he had the hits though, and that's that he had the arsenal of hits, but you know, the Stevie Wonder that we all know and love, the one that, that I believe picked up the mantle for the Beatles, the Beatles left off with his canon of just 70s records and life-changing records, and the same for the Staple Singers, the same for Sly and the Family Stone, like especially with Sly and the Family Stone. This is, this is just a dress rehearsal. It was unannounced. This was a dress rehearsal for Woodstock. That's right. And Woodstock will change Sly's life. So like 10 days from that performance, Sly will get what he asked for, but also we, most of us know what happened with Sly Stone. Um, it, it's a painful look at be careful for what you ask for. So there's so many questions I have, but in my mind I was just thinking like, well, was it clearance issues? Was it the fact that they weren't household names yet? Was it, you know, is it easily that disposable? I'm not saying that it's ex inexcusable, but you know, at the time I was reading um, Prince's autobiography, um, and there's a moment, I mean, it's, it's, it's short because he only got to four chapters before he passed away, but in chapter three, he wanted to sort of dispel some myths about what we thought, to be, what we thought was his childhood. And he talks about like a, a fuzzy memory with his dad. Um, and his dad takes him as an 11 year old to go see Woodstock. And that's when I realized like, oh, Woodstock the movie was the, was the beautiful brochure that got to contextualize what the 60s were about. Because even in comparing and contrasting, looking up information and whatnot, you know, if even three of the things that happened at Woodstock happened at the Harlem Cultural Festival, we would have all heard about it. Like, and we fine tooth comb, like, okay, were there any incidents? Was, did people crash the gates? Was there rampant drug use? Was there, you know, sodomy in the streets or any of these things that happened, acid take, anything? There was no incidents whatsoever. And, you know, that's when I realized, like, oh, the marketing of Woodstock, the idea of Woodstock is what sort of penetrated uh, you know, our, our brains in, in terms of how it got contextualized in history. And we just never got that chance. What wound up on that mantle or on that platform of black joy was Soul Train. So Soul Train actually winds up being the first look that, the first national look that America and the world gets of unabashed black joy and Afrocentricity. It should have been this film. But even then, like in 1971, like what, who would paint it as such? Like, you know, who, it depends also on the, the creative behind it. So, but I, I actually think that 50 years later, 
this film can still work its potent magic. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Very important and incre incredibly timely. Also, you had no idea what was going to happen. You know, you, you were like not finished when the pandemic started. I will say that timing. Timing is everything. Um, and I, I knew I knew it because um, at the time I was asking myself, OK, what will each generation get from this? And thank God I was quarantining with different generations. So my girlfriend has t uh, a millennial and a Gen Z. And so, you know, have my, my weekly uh, uh, focus groups at the farm. <laughs> Yeah, just have my weekly focus groups at the farm, and you know, I, I could I could tell in the beginning it was sort of like the obligatory. All right, let's see what Amir wants to force us to watch this week, that sort of thing. But I I knew that I knew that we had, uh, of course, Gen X. I knew that we had baby boomers. Uh, for anyone fortunate enough to still be alive, early thirties, late twenties. Betty White's age, whatever. The, what are they called, the fortunate few? I'm still a boomer. <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't pointing to you, stop playing. <laughs> yeah, but the thing was, um, I didn't know how we were gonna connect millennials and Gen Z, and I was, we were grasping at straws. I thought like, well, okay, so I know that Drake is related to Larry Graham of Sly and the Family Stone. Drake's father is Larry Graham's brother, the bass player. Um, and so I was like, okay, there's a connection there. Maybe we can get Drake to come help us sell the film to anyone born in the 90s. And, um, or like maybe Beyonce can explain gospel singing or that sort of thing. Um, and that was like all you know, 2018, 2019. And then post March 15th, 2020, um, a weird thing happened, which was, you know, the news cycle, the current news cycle, and what we were editing, you couldn't tell the difference at all. You could not tell the difference. And, you know, it was one of those uh, Doc Brown flex capacitor eureka moments where it was like, yo, like, the connection isn't musical or creative. The connection is that Gen Z and millennials are living through exactly what we're editing. They're going to see it. We're going, and that's the thing. Like the the one thing that most people have told me is that like I feel seen, which is not just an internet meme. Like it's it's real. Like I feel seen. Even when Musa Jackson was crying. Like, you know, I was, I was quasi dismissive because like I looked at him and I was like, no way this guy, it, 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 I'm certain that he's just one or two years older than I am or something. We looked at this ID and it was like, he's 57, 58? Wow, that's amazing. And, but then I thought like, well, what five-year-old is really gonna give us anything emotional? So I wanted to get him out the way first because I just like, okay, what, you, you were there, what do you remember? And, you know, and we showed him no context whatsoever, and he just basically spit back to us everything that we had, everything that we haven't even seen yet. Like, we just saw, like, some of the fifth dimension footage and, and some of the raw, like, the, the photos that have not been seen yet, and he was just literally describing everything that we had. And so after the interview, um, Musa Jackson just, we showed him footage, like, by the way, we have footage of the, you know, if you want to see the fifth dimension thing, and when he's seen it, it just, it just floored him. And that's, that's when we just slowly realized, like, behind the camera, like, yo, like, this is, this is someone getting their life back. And then when Merlin McCoo and Billy Davis Jr., when they were touched by it, and in my mind, I'm like, well, you guys have been legends for 55 years. Like, this is just an average, I would just think this is just a, a regular gig or whatever, but um, for, for half a second, I saw something that I related to 
when when Marilyn started talking, because even in my situation and like the first twenty years of the roots, the anxiety the anxiety I would go through if we're opening up for Soundgarden or Beck or a system of a down, like you can't do the same shows with them that you would do with Lauren Hill and a tribe called Quest and the Fujis. And like that idea of code switching, like would keep me up at nights, like totally, yo, we gotta change the show, man. And you know, and it was it it, it was exhausting. It was so exhausting, like always having to change our stripes to make sure that we were safe and <laughs> that our audience felt safe. Like and I saw when she said that. Because it was it was confusing me because I was like I've followed you guys since I was a kid and I don't think I've ever held, heard uh, Billy. Da I was joking. I was like I never heard Billy Davis Jr. raise his voice or do any gospel growling and, or any of those things. And I was just like I never heard you do that. And instantly when her eyes started puffing, I was like, oh wow, I, I maybe I said too much or whatever. And she was just like because we could finally be ourselves and not have to cross our T's and dot our I's every like, and she just said like, it, it was very exhausting to have, to have to always make sure that your appearance was right and all those things and the, the, the very things that they had to do that Sly and the Family Stone refused to do, wear regular clothes, be intersectional, yeah white guy, be our drummer, like all that was unusual. You know, it was never seen before. And and to see, I wish I could have put more of the camera for during the sly footage, because even though the excitement of anyone under 25 was overwhelming, like you saw the way they were rushing the stage and all those things, because sly wasn't announced, but you know, the the, the camera on on the adults, the, the gospel adults, the, the elders, Oh man, they were just, they were frightened. They'd never seen like fringe outfits and buckskin boots and crazy hairstyles. Like they look like aliens. And to see that the audience like just look like, what is this? The kids are going crazy, but the adults were scared. And then by the third or fourth song, Sly had managed to convert that whole entire audience. But my initial, I initially wanted to just focus on how scary Sly and the Family Stone was to a, a group of older people that never seen that blatant disregard for the rules, like, so. We could go on, and it would be very pleasurable. Yeah, I was like, I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm the guy no, that can talk longer than the <laughs> they, film. They're so. telling me we, we got to go, but <laughs> but th th thank you, thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you, I appreciate this. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.